Hey, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good whatever it is in your area. How's everybody doing tonight? So I've got things rearranged a little bit so that I've got your readout coming down through closer to the camera so that hopefully I don't look as if I'm staring off into space ignoring everybody today. Um, if you're new to the live feed and the, and the live chat, basically what I do is I log in for about an hour. You're more than welcome to post up questions. You're more than welcome to ask about um, videos and stuff in the past. Um, I usually prefer not to get questions about my personal life, but you know, the occasional decent question I'll answer. I have no issue with that. Um, you're welcome to go and ask about the house, ask about the tractors, ask about projects, ask about anything you've seen, and just, you know, general stuff. I get a lot of people that ask about how to's and things that they need to fix and all that kind of stuff. So feel free to kick in. <laughs> And apparently my girlfriend's kicking in, making sure to blow me some kisses. So it's going to be a good show. It's always nice when you can start off with the lady appreciating you. Uh, let's see. So apparently you guys are having arguments about something to do with Xbox 360s. I'm not a gamer by any means, so I can't really give you any ideas as far as that's concerned. Um, you know... In order to answer the question of what's in the cup, which is what I always end up getting, we got our Redneck Computer Geek cup and we got the cheap welder million dollar ideas going on. Um, it's peppermint tea tonight. <clears throat> I've had a little bit of a scuff or whatever in my throat, so we're going with peppermint tea tonight. Uh, coffee's always great, always my favorite thing. I really need to buy a coffee maker. Um, that's definitely next on my list of things to buy. <laughs> yep, my girlfriend's pointing out the curtain in the back. She picked it, that curtain there. That's her That's her curtain that she enjoys. What do you guys think? Do you guys, have, do you guys like skulls or what? All right, let's see. How's cleaning up the house going? Um, cleaning up the house is progressing, but very, very slow. Uh, this time of year, it's more about just making sure to survive through January into February. Uh, made a massive killing on the fact that I managed to get all the propane and everything caught up, managed to go and get the lawyer charges from everything that's been going on all caught up. So we're back on track and we're going to go and be getting back into stuff. The problem with this time of year is it very rarely gets above freezing, which means it's really hard to keep moving on stuff. You're missing the cocoa. Thanks. <laughs> okay, let's hear the crazy mix combos since my girlfriend decided to instigate this one. My girlfriend, for breakfast, I kid you not, this is totally straight up. My girlfriend, for breakfast, likes to have peppermint tea with three scoops of cocoa in it. Who else has somebody that likes some stupid, strange, crazy, whatever type thing? Me? I like my coffee, usually black or with a little bit of milk. Her, on the other hand, she likes cocoa with peppermint in it, and she likes cocoa with cinnamon tea in it. But, yeah, who else has a crazy mixture? All right. All right, let's get back into other questions. Belt slipping on an LT2000. Gunner, if you're dealing with a older belt that's had the chance to go and stretch, that's one of the reasons why it is. I tell everybody, spend the extra 10 bucks, go with an actual honest-to-God Kevlar belt. Uh, it's a lot better off for you. You're a lot less likely to have belt slippage and, stre and stretching. Um, the one thing I'll warn you about dealing with Kevlar, though, is that if you have any idler pulleys that stick at all that are plastic, the Kevlar is going to eat those things in a matter of a month. So pay attention, spin them up, double check everything. Uh, let's see. When are you going to start on more mowers? You said something about a track a couple of videos ago. Yes, I did talk about a track. I actually have been recently talking with another YouTuber who actually did tracks for a tractor. 
Um, if you guys have never checked him out, go to I Save Tractors and write a comment. I don't care what video you do it on Plague His Channel. Go to I Save Tractors and write Redneck Computer Geek sent me. Um, I would love to go and see his comments get blown up with Redneck Computer Geek sent me. So it's I Save Tractors. He did a John Deere with tracks on the back. I'm actually going to be talking with him about how he did it, how we set him up. I believe he's got another video in the works if you want to go check that out and see what he's coming up with. Um, really good guy. Norman is really cool. He's really on key. Uh, he works on a lot of older machines, and he and I have been talking about the idea of maybe some collaboration back and forth. So go kick him up. I don't care what video you choose. Just Redneck Computer Geek sent me. Just absolutely plague his channel. All right, let's see. What would you recommend for a good rear end to flip for a 4x4 mod? To flip for a 4x4 mod? I'm really not sure what you're asking there. Um, I've built with everything from Spicer 3600s to Peerless 930s to MST 204s to MST 206s. Um, I've worked with footies and all of them. The, the real reality of the situation is if you're dealing with the mowers that had, um, that had all wheel steer in order to have the steering knuckles that people build the 4x4s out of, you have to have matching transaxles in order to do it. So if you have a 930 in the rear, you need a 930 in front. If you're dealing with an MST-205 in the rear, you need an MST-205 in the front. The other thing that you could potentially do, which is the reason why it is a lot of the guys are talking about using MSTs, is that an MST-204 has the same gears in it as an MST-206, just it has two extras. So you can take a 206 and turn it into the same gear ratio as a 204, which would allow you to essentially have two 204s in order to make 4x4. Four four. I think that's what you're asking. Hopefully I got you correctly. How's Main Mud Mower doing? You must not have caught the video where Main Mud Mower doesn't exist anymore. It's a, I built Mud Wizard out of parts from the original Main Mud Mower, plus a whole bunch of upgraded stuff. Um, Main Mud Mower got tied in with another YouTuber that ended up with bad connotations. So I built Mud Wizard so that I could start independently building up from there as far as the off-road stuff is concerned. Can you give any quick tips for somebody trying to grow their YouTube channel from Jason's Custom House? So the one quick tip that I always give to everybody is content first, distribution second. Listen to your comments and allow the negativity to stay. Um, so build your content first. If somebody goes to look at your channel and you only have two videos, they go, ah, this, this guy's a waste of time. If you if they go to look at your channel and you've got off the first page number of videos, I think it's 14 in the current format. Um, yeah, it's 14 on a 19-inch screen right now. Um, then they see that you have content. They see that you've consistently posted. Then they subscribe. The other thing is you will get subscribers if you're constant if you make sure that your descriptions have info in them. Um, I actually have a friend of mine, he started a YouTube channel. Uh, it's under the name of Jerk of All Trades. He recently posted up a video and his video was about his Macy Ferguson that he calls Fergie. And in that video, it's a really good video. He talks about the different things that are going on with it. He talks about how to get it started. He is very joking, he's very, very knowledgeable in the video, but the one thing he forgot was in the description. He didn't fill out the description 
with the info about the tractor. And that is really important because people will search for that particular Macy Ferguson. They'll search for the particular model number. And then when they see your stuff, they think you're cool. They think you're interesting. They subscribe. So those are the two ways that you get subscribers is you get subscribers from them searching and finding your stuff is cool. You get subscribers when you start posting it to places that are relevant to the content. That's my couple of things that I'll give for you. All right, let's see. What would be the best way to make front suspension on a mud mower, like on a YS 4500? Well, you're dealing with a Craftsman AYP chassis at that point, which pretty much means you could clone my setup if you wanted to. Uh, what a lot of other people do is they use really, really soft shocks on either side of your front spindles in order to allow it to have some give to either side. The problem is, is once you divorce that front axle from the chassis, you are going to have to have either a three link, a triangle link, or a four link suspension of some sort. And at that point, you're dropping cash that most people don't want to put in a mud mower. Um, mud Wizard's front end is not as complete as I would like it to be. And to put that in perspective, I've got close to somewhere in the range of about $150 worth of material into building that between the custom steering knuckles, the custom A-frame, um, the custom, I mean, custom ladder bar suspension, the custom shocks and everything else. It adds up pretty quick. Will you ever buy a snowmobile? I actually don't get into snowmobiles. Um, one of those things I've talked about in the past on a couple of other videos, I actually have nerve damage from the neck down and I have major issues with the cold and ironically live in Maine. So I don't particularly like to go snowmobiling because in the case of an emergency of something shuts down my body actually physically shuts down in the cold really fast so snowmobiles are an overly inherent danger to me and i just tend to stay away from them i like snowmobiling i will borrow a snowmobile and i will go along with somebody but as far as snowmobiles myself i don't get into them What you do about pain from working on mowers. I'm not sure what kind of pain you're describing as far as working on mowers. Um, I was a computer tech for many years. I have active carpal tunnels started in both of my hands and stuff like that. I take turmeric supplements. If you've ever looked into that, it helps a lot with um, arthritis and stuff like that. But otherwise than that, pain management to me is just mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. All right, let's see. I get parts from my old tractor from Norm. Yeah, Norman is cool. I save tractors, Norman. I Seriously, if you're here, go, go look his channel up or something either after this or when you get the chance, subscribe. He's well worth it. Um, I totally support him. Have you ever snorkeled a mud mower? <laughs> yes, go back in the original mud, mo mud Wizard videos. You'll see the whole snorkel kit and everything. We tested that all the way up through to the flywheel, and it'll run all the way underwater up to the flywheel. It currently won't right now because the PCV hose needs to be replaced, but the moment that gets replaced, we'll be all set.
Carts and cameras. Um, what size front pulley should I run on my Craftsman mud mower? Craftsmans are really odd in that their clutch is really close to the front engine pulley. I believe the number standard that we usually end up talking about is usually a five and a half inch pulley that fits in there. You can fit a six, but you're going to end up needing to switch over to an idler that's a three inch V pulley. And it needs to be metal because it is going to end up hitting the engine pulley and grinding down. Um, the other thing about a Craftsman when you're dealing with them is that what I actually recommend is to take the deck drive pulley and to flip it up and to use that. Cut the bottom edge off of the actual engine pulley, mount the deck pulley up against it, weld it in place, and use that spindle in order to set yourself up. The, uh, the deck pulley on those has a really, really wide lip. The, it's usually like this on most, and it's like this on a deck pulley on most of those craftsmen. So if you use that, then it gives you extra throw area to go and catch your belt in when you're setting it up. That's always been my number one mod that I've told everybody to do. It's amazing how many people don't seem to want to do it, but I've done it on every single build. Um, I've done it on a five-speed go-kart build. I've done it on Mud Wizard. I did it on the original main mud mower. I've done it on all of them. Um, actually, the drive belt pulley that is on my transmission in Mud Wizard is actually a deck pulley pulled off of a LT2000, if I remember right. Um, yet again, because the flange on the outside on those is way bigger. Would a four-wheeler front end with the A-arms work all right for the front of your tractor? Okay, so look. Okay, let's get into some sketching here. Okay, I see this quite often. And here's one of the big problems that we got here. Let's see if we can do a sketching. Okay, so if you have... Okay, so over here, if you have an ATV and you've got your tie rods, your steering comes down and goes to your tie rods, and then your pivot point for your suspension is right here. Okay, so when you go back and forth, there's very little buckling that happens here. But if you have a tractor, you've got a frame this wide, Your steering ends up out here, and yet your control is here, and you've got your tie rods coming down. This creates a buckling point that you're going to run into, and that buckling point is what I see on all of those builds. If you want to go and do the A-arms off of one of those, you're going to have to actually put in... A steering box of some sort. You're going to have to have some sort of rack and pinion that's in the front of those, whether it's a go-kart, whether it's, it's anything. You're going to have to have a rack and pinion that's as wide, essentially, as the inner um, frame rail where you have your pivot point, because otherwise those tie rods are going to bind every single time that you come up and down and you're going to change your tires on the front as they bind. All right, let's see. What do we got going on? Personally, I like anything from 16.5 to 18 horsepower opposed twins. Opposed twins are hard to kill. I mean, they're, they're hands down one of my favorite motors to work on as they're just plain hard to kill. The other thing I love about an opposed twin is you literally can have a dead doornail spark plug on one side of an opposed twin 
or a dead coil or something on that other side, and it'll still run. It, it, it just amazes me. They will still run. If you try that with a V, it'll knock. It'll do all kinds of stupid things. Won't run. But an opposed twin, on the other hand, it'll just stay running. What are your thoughts on putting a plow on a self-propelled snowblower? So I see somebody do that about every two years or so on YouTube, and everybody always kicks up and talks about how cool they are and everything else. But what's interesting about those videos is that inevitably those videos are of about four to six inches of snow, and it's all fluffy snow. I really, 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 really don't don't agree with the idea. And the reason being is because I have pushed snow with everything from trucks to cars to lawn tractors to push plows to all of it. And if you were dealing with, say, six inches of snow or less and maybe a push distance of, oh, probably about 15 feet or so at the least, you might be able to do it. But I'll tell you from pushing with the GT6000, which is probably a close to 800 pounds worth of pushing force. The moment you get over about six inches worth of snow and you get any rain, any condensation on it that is moist at all, you got to have at least 10 feet of, of ramming speed in order to push 20 feet. For every 20 feet, you need 10 feet of ramming speed. If, if you got to go 20 feet from a dead stop, you might make it 10. That's going to be your problem if you try and do one of those. I've always wanted to build one just for the heck of it to see what would happen. The other thing that I would do, though, if I was going to do it, if this was me, straight up, if this was me, I would, A, I would build it with, I would build it with a pulley swap to speed it up, first of all, because you want ramming speed. Second of all, I would build it so that the plow actually was slide in. I would build it with two square coupler fronts. Um, you could even use two inch adapters straight off for a truck or something like that. Um, you could have slide in bars and I would have a V plow with rollovers so that it came up and around so that you could V cut down through walkways, things like that. And that way you could slide in and pin also a push plow. That would be what I would do if it was me. I would build both. Um, I would build it as just a drive in, couple it in, drop a couple of pins and go for it. All right, let's see if we can catch up back through on some of the comments here. And feel free to post questions. I love posting questions. I really don't want to talk about myself for an hour that just absolutely is boring. I'm really not that interesting. Um, let's see what we got here. Ever mud mower a K-series Kohler? <laughs> oh, I'm going to take some heat for this comment. Um, so old school, you probably will never see me mud mower a K-series Kohler. And the reason being you will probably never see me mud mower one is because I never see them alive. Um, if you're talking about the K-series that stands straight up with the vertical shaft, that particular series of K-series Kohler, uh, the, the 10, 11, 12, and 14 horsepowers up here in Maine there is something about the the oiling system that is in those older K series that they just do not survive in our winters. And if they've been used on any of those older John Deere's or the Bolins or anything like that, and they were used um, during the winter, for some reason they eat the bearings out and then they snap the rod and they drive it through the rear end. Um, I probably. 
I would bet off camera. I would bet off camera. I probably have bought, traded, swapped close to eight John Deere's with blown out K series in them. Um, I don't even bother trying to rebuild them. I have a guy that's in Northern Maine that if I get a hold of him and it's one that he wants, I sell it to him. If he doesn't want it, I junkyard it. Uh, but yeah, K series just do not seem to survive in the cold. They, they, they eat the bearing in the bottom due to something to do with the oil system and then bam, straight out the rear. I have a 16 horsepower opposed Briggs and Stratton and had a broken ear off below the carb and I JB welded it in back on and was wondering if I could use one off a different Opie. I could use one off of a different Opie. Well, yeah, you should be able to use a different one. Your your issue. Okay, so opposed twins, if I remember right, if you're dealing with the older black opposed twin, the six horsepower and the 18 horsepower both use the same carburetor. So you theoretically should be able to use an 18 horsepower carburetor. Uh, the other thing you could do is look into whether the carburetors have jet capability. You could pull your jet out of your 16 horse, put it into an 18 horse carb so that that way you've got the correct jet. And I would think it would work, but I'm sure somebody will tell me if I'm wrong down in the comments. Carts and cameras. Should I run a five inch in the front and a five in the rear? Is that a good ratio? Um, to answer your question, the number one recommendation I tell to every, every, every person that starts into mud mowers is I always tell them to run a one-to-one -one ratio. Start off with a one-to-one. -one, and the reason being is because your transaxle pulley, especially if you've got a five-inch engine pulley, if you've got a five-inch engine pulley and you put a five-inch on pretty much just about any five-speed that's on the market, whether it's a whether it's a Spicer 3600 or whether you're dealing with an, um, a Peerless 830 or an MST 205, the general thing about those is that Spicer stock runs about seven mile per hour, which means if you go a five to a five, you end up with usually around 18 on 22 inch tires. If you have a five to a five on an MST 205 or a 930, which runs at eight miles per hour stock, and you put 22 inch tires, generally you religiously end up at somewhere between 19 to 20 miles per hour. An MST-206 runs at just a little bit above eight, almost nine horse, uh, nine miles per hour stock, which means you end up with 22 inch tires at about 21 to 22 horsepower. That's usually my go-to formula that I tell everybody. It's not perfect, but as far as a generic answer, that's usually the one I give. What does the sign say behind you? Oh, this one? It's from my old workplace. It says Belfast Computers Parking Only. Other vehicles will be shipped, uh, stripped, and sold on eBay. Other vehicles will be stripped and sold on eBay. Whatever, I can put that up later. Hey, you want to see something cool? I was cleaning the other day and I found this. So you guys know how I made the gas powered power wheel and everything and all that kind of stuff? So this is me and my little sister 
That's my sister three. And that's me driving. So if she's three, I, let's see, she's three, six, nine. I'd be nine at the time. So that's me in a miniature gas powered car. Don't know why it won't focus. That's me in a miniature gas powered car driving my little sister around when I was nine years old. That's some pretty cool stuff, huh? I see you have Steam on your computer. What games do you play? <laughs> uh, let's see. I love Worms Armageddon. John and I play Worms Armageddon a lot. Um, I really totally love playing Red Faction Guerrilla. I've been through that multiple times. I like playing Craft World every once in a while. Wrecker Fest is definitely really good. I like playing Wrecker Fest. Um, I play Forts occasionally. Forts is kind of reminds me of the old snowball games and the cannon games that we used to play back in Windows 98. So I like that. Um, John really likes the Flat Out series. Uh, John really likes Flat Out 2 and he likes Flat Out 4. The original is okay, and the third one just was a waste of everybody's time. Um, let's see, what else do I play? Um, Dungeons of the Endless is a pretty good game. If you're trying to kill time, I like that. And... Oh, Car Mechanic Simulator. Uh, Car Mechanic Simulator version 18. 17 was pretty good. I ended up getting 18 on a special deal. So it's usually like 40 bucks. I got it for 10 bucks. Absolutely love Car Simulator. Um, they've done a lot in it over the last six months to actually update it and make it more like the real thing. There's a couple of little, like, little quirky things um, that I've actually sent in a couple of heads up to them that aren't exactly right if you're anybody who works on vehicles, but for the most part, they're actually pretty good. They, uh, they get most things correct as far as brakes and, and shocks. Some of the engine building stuff is kind of fun to get into, and they don't get overly in-depth about doing the build and stuff. If you are a, oh, what is it? Do, do, do. Oh, Dungeons 3. That's the other one that I like to play. I like to play Dungeons 3, um, and I used to play uh, I used to play Card Life a lot, but Card Life started doing this thing where they, they're... <laughs> Basically, Card Life ended up overextended. They had so many people join that they couldn't maintain their own server, and so what they decided to do was instead of maintaining whatever you built, if you did not log in within every two weeks, they actually ended up deleting everything that you had built in the project world that you were playing in. Um, which is the reason why it is I kind of quit playing. Every once in a while I go in and I tinker with it, but I don't know. It's kind of like a 3D version of Minecraft that really could have been really, really up there, but instead just kind of flop because they decided not to put money in when they should have. All right, let's go back and see what we got going on here. Will you do another Mudmore build video from start to finish? So there's a couple of different Mudmower ideas that people have decided to kick my way in the last year or so, and I'm tossing up a few of them. Um, I've got a lot of people that have been asking to see a monster Mudmower build. 
And I'm not really sure that I want to go full monster, but maybe mini monster build. Maybe something that runs maybe 31 inch Ford Ranger tires. Something that's junkyard buildable. Something that you could be able to go to the junkyard, get some tires and get some hubs and with a little bit of fabrication, potentially be able to build yourself. Um, so I've got a lot of monster build requests. The problem right now that I'm running into is I need to build storage before I build projects. And I can't build storage until I get to spring and get some income going. And I can't get income going without building some projects. So I'm in this really weird catch-22 right now. I'm going to progress the gas-powered power wheel build a little bit and level that out a bit. And then from there, we'll work on some other stuff. I want to do a mud mower build starting in the spring once things start rolling over into lawn tractor season in order to split up the videos between um, tractor hunt videos, mud mower videos, gas-powered power wheel videos. And I've been invited to run the mud mower at some off-road terrain areas. So I want to go and get it diversified. Right now, I just don't have the finances to diversify much. What I've really debated also is everybody wants to see an MTD build. Now, I know personally from pushing MTD transaxles as far as I have in the gas-powered power wheel build, pretty much what their breaking point is. And I don't think you could ever build a mud mower as extreme as Mud Wizard out of an MTD build. But I do think you could build something that's more kid friendly in order to be able to do for a mud mower build. Something that would be simplistic and easy for, say, a kid about John's age to young teenager. And then progress into something like Craftsman LT1000s and Murray's for teenager mud, mud mower builds. Um, that's where I'm debating going with it, is building a mini MTD mud mower that John could do versus my big mud wizard build. You know, feel free to throw up some ideas. And if you're, if you're not familiar with my channel, you're more than welcome to punch me out an email at any point. It's Maine is in the state, M A. M-A-I-N-E, mud, mower, at yahoo.com. And feel free to throw me some ideas. So we got a pretty generic question here. But I'm going to, I'm going to, Go for it anyway. What's the best transaxle for a mud mower? Hands down, hands down, without without any question, let's go down through the list, okay? We got Spicers and Footies. Below them is, a, is the Peerless 930. The Spicer is actually a clone of a Peerless 930. This is why it is we're coming down, okay? Above that Spicer, we've got MTD transaxles pretty much on par or a little bit worse than, okay? MTDs. No ifs, ands, or buts, worst transaxle possible is anything that is a hydro. Totally worst, worst, poss worst, worst thing possible, okay? So we're at 930, okay? Peerless 930s, basically from there, you end up into the... MST series. You've got MST 204, MST 205, MST 203, MST 206. And last I knew there actually was an MST 202 also. The MST 202 is not, not, keyword here, not compatible any of the internals with the other MSTs. So if you ever see one of those, they are hot commodity to sell on eBay, rip it out, sell it, buy yourself three different MST-204s and be happy, okay? From there, we've got the 820. 
Now, the 820 actually is questionable as to whether the 820 is actually better than an MST-206. The 930 was actually upgraded to the MST-206, and the reason being is because they eliminated the gear, uh, they eliminated the chain drive in a 930 to make it a gear drive in an MST-206 through 204. And then in the 820, some brilliant moron in some manufacturing department or science or whatever engineer decided to put the chain drive back in. And that's the weak link oftentimes in the 801 and the, eight, and the 820. From there, you drop into the side pulley transaxles, which have solid one-inch axles. They've got bull gears that are as big as a Ford Ranger and stuff like that. At that point, you're talking the uh, the Ropers and the Peerlesses. You've got 20, uh, 2300s and you've got 633s. And those are just the epitome of strong. Uh, those are in your Sears Suburbans, your Ropers and things like that. Those are just unkillable. The problem with those is that you can shift on the go all the others. If you have a... If you do not have the high-low shift on your Peerless 633, that's pretty much about your only shift-on-the-go option unless you can manage to be good enough. And I've seen guys do it, so don't argue whether it can be done. Um, if you're good enough to rev match your engine to your transmission pulley, you can shift on the go a side pulley Peerless or a Roper. Is it a good idea? No. Are you most likely going to grind and blow up something that's really expensive and hard to replace? Probably. I have an old Dynamark mower with a 12.5 Tecumseh and has a 5-speed in it. If it's a 12.5 and it's an original Tecumseh, it's probably got a Spicer 5-speed in it. Um, the way that you really can tell really, really quickly um, is reach your hand up in underneath and... Okay. So you've got where your bull gear bulge is on your transaxle underneath. If it has one, two ridges, it's a Spicer. If it has one, two, three... And then a fourth, it is most likely an older 930. If it's got one, two, three, four, or five, then it is most likely a uh, MST series. If it's got all the sets of ridges, it's most likely an MST. If it's got four, then it's most likely a 930. If it's only got two ridges, it's the cheapest possible spicer or a footy. Actually, that one's so old, it might actually be an original footy. The Hydro Mudders transaxle went into the junkyard a long time ago, but I did end up with another transaxle that is similar to the one that the Hydro Mudder originally had. So that build will be coming back. It just currently is under a lot of snow and frozen to the ground and iced in. And I'm pretty sure the motor doesn't run anymore, but we'll bring it back. Will you ever build a racing mower? I would love to build a racing mower, except for the problem is the nearest racetrack to me is two and a half hours drive from me. And they only race um, on the weekends. And that's during the time that I have John and everything with me. So unless I can find somebody to go down through that races in an alternative event or some something that I trust to watch John during that time, it's unfortunately not going to happen. Plus, that's hundreds of dollars that I need to drop into a machine that I have to drive two and a half hours. And that's just one way. 
So it's two and a half hours to get there. Most likely stay overnight. So I've got to pay to stay overnight. And then on top of that, I've got to do everything else. Calgary Motorsports, I have a lifted mud mower. Calgary, when did you build a lifted? I've been watching you for years. Huh. Was that during the time that I was homeless? Because I really honestly did not watch much YouTube during the time I was homeless, living in a cabin in the middle of nowhere. Um... I'll have to go back through. I'll look you up. I didn't realize you had done that. What do you think of Gibson tractors? Um, that's actually the reason why it is. I've been telling you guys a lot to go check out um, I Save Tractors. He deals with older equipment, and I deal with newer stuff. So as far as Gibson goes, I don't deal with them. Um, to be totally truthful with you, I do what I do to make money. There is no money in restoring older machines here in Maine. Um, here in Maine, antique tractors, yes, there is an antique tractor group and there, it, there, there's a population of antique tractor guys, but the problem is you have to have storage for it. You've got to have heated storage for it most of the time, and you've got to have the money to be able to maintain that storage. And that's the only way antique stuff survives in the state of Maine, which means that if they have it, they already have it. And nobody wants more of it. So anytime I get antique stuff, unless it's something I actually have an interest in, I usually deliberately offload it somewhere. I go out of my way to advertise it and to try and sell it for parts usually for about a month or two months while I have it stored out of the way of the YouTube channel. And then if it doesn't sell after that, unfortunately, I usually scrap it. Okay. Hunter wants to know, I plow my driveway with a Craftsman GT. I was wondering how you would go about rigging the mower deck lift to lift the plow. If you're talking about an older GT6000, your mower deck lift just comes down and hits the plow lift. So I'm going to assume you're talking about a newer GT. Because the newer GT, you've got that weird bar thing, if I remember right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but if it was me, I, I would just put a winch on. Um, you can get a 2,000-pound winch from Harbor Freight for like 50 bucks. All you'd have to do is just build a up bracket that comes up and mount the winch over the top of it. And it's all control. So I would just put a winch right on the front of it and go for it. Uh, the one thing that I'll tell you if you use a winch in order to plow with, that nobody ever teaches you until it's already too late and you bend something is if you're going to hit. So let's say you're plowing and this is a drop off. If you're plowing and your plow catches that drop off, it pulls down. Okay. Does that make sense? So when it catches that drop off and it pulls down, if you've got a winch connected that pulls down on the front of your tractor. So 
if you're approaching anything with a drop off, you've got to make sure to have extra cable out so that when it drops, it's got playroom. Um, that's the one thing that I would really, really say that you need to play, pay attention to. All right. So I'm just going to give everybody a warning. We got about 10 minutes left. I'm going to cycle down through and try and get to some of the questions that are still left here. Um, I definitely can't be late tonight. It's date night out with Jesse. So we're going to go play some pool and have a couple of sodas and um, probably get some French fries down at the local bar. Send it, Smith, as far as your question is concerned. This is exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to emailing me. Grab some pictures. Grab some info. Send me an email. Main, M-A-I-N-E, mudmower at yahoo.com. Unfortunately, I don't have enough information to be able to answer you there. But I can go and get you the information, hopefully, if you send me some stuff. I have a six-speed footy from a 87 Craftsman. Are they worth rebuilding? Let me answer that question with the only transmission I have not exploded over the years, or at least exploded one of, is a Spicer 3600 six, uh, five-speed, which is currently what's in Mud Wizard right now, and it's got a zinc locker in it. So Spicers really aren't that bad. Really, in all honesty, what explodes transmissions is people don't deal with the frame flex in the back of the machine. You've got those two pedestals that the transaxle is sitting on. Weld those solid. Make them so that they are rugged as snot. Make that whole square section so that it is a solid block of metal and never flexes ever. And you don't blow up transmissions one right after another. What happens is, where your spider gear setup comes in, you flex that bowl gear around and you drive it through the case and you blow things up. My mud mower is a 1990 rally that goes 30 miles per hour. Well, good for you. There's always a tree somewhere to hit. How do you make the mower go faster? There's all kinds of mud mower videos on my channel about that, but the answer to the question is you put a smaller transaxle pulley on, you put a bigger engine pulley on. I really recommend doing a five to a five as far as size, but to each their own. But, all right, guys, so we're getting towards the end of things here. Um, you know, I always like to go and tell you guys, you know, straight outright that if you have any questions, feel free to hit me up on the Facebook page. Feel free to go and hit me up as far as personal email and stuff like that is concerned. You guys have my email address. You have my Facebook page most of the time. And I'm sorry that you cannot comment. I'm currently... Um, I'm currently dealing with YouTube and how stupid they're being about the comments. I'm on my 15th email series with them at this point in nine months. And 
it just is what it is. How are you doing, man, worried about your health? Why are you worried about my health? <laughs> okay. Take five seconds to write why you're worried about my health. Have you gone to Canada and met Pug One? No. I, uh, I honestly am <laughs> politely stated I'm not a Pug One fan. Um, I really was not supportive of Pug One when he decided to hire people to do his stunts and then somebody ended up with a major back injury that screwed them up for life and Pug One won. He won in court um, and was able to keep all the money made during that video. Something, something like $60,000 was made off of that video and he managed to keep all the money while somebody else is permanently pretty much in a wheelchair. Um, I don't support Pug and just that's not the way I roll. What are your thoughts on swapping a eight horsepower to a five horsepower on a snowblower? I wouldn't bother. It's a waste of time. Um, you're going to notice a huge difference between a five and an eight. We see machines like that show up here in Maine all the time, and they just don't throw snow. They don't have the torque. If it was built to have an eight, it's built to have an eight or a nine. If if you've got an eight, upgrade to a nine horsepower Briggs. If, if you've got a five, you upgrade to an eight. Um, you never go backwards. You're going to notice it big time, just not worth it. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, yes, I have had mole issues that have ended up coming up as active growth. Um, and as it is right now, I'm okay. I do have three that have to be re-removed from, from me, unfortunately. Um, actually, you can see there's one there. There's one right there. Um, I've got them all over my chest. That's one that had to be removed. And... I've had others that have had to be removed. There's that one there. I've got three down the side of I've got uh, three down the side of my leg that kids like to go and point out that I look like I got shot. Um, I've got two on the side of my face that had to be removed. One on the top of my head that had to be removed. Um, at this point, it's pre-can, it's it's active, it's active growth, and they're attempting to make sure that it doesn't end up as cancerous spread, which is which is cancerous, but it's not cancer in the way we think of it as far as like chemo patients and stuff like that. Um, what I'm in is a treatment to keep me from getting to the cancerous point that I have to go in for that kind of treatment. Um, I actually grow this sideburn down in order to cover up where they had to slice out something about the size of a quarter on the side of my face. Um, I actually have a, uh, I actually have one on the bottom of my foot that they had to slice off. I tell you what, you ever want to go and have the most, are you kidding me, stupidest medical thing ever? On just, like, if your foot looks like this, it's right there on my foot. And out of every single one of these that was sliced off, um, I even had to have one sliced off of my private area. Um, out of all of those that were sliced off, 
that stupid one on my foot was without question the most painful. Um, I've had a lot of people ask about the skin cancer thing. I've debated doing a video about it, what I went through and how they were treated and what I had to do afterwards. Um, a lot of people don't realize just how deep they have to cut you for it. They also don't realize the scars afterwards because they're so deep. They're oftentimes, um, oftentimes the nerve ending is actually, <laughs> is actually traumatized and hurt and, um, they're painful. Um, the scar that's on my chest, I, I, I tell you what, you could, you could hit my hand directly with a hammer two or three times before I would ever want you to pinch that stupid thing some days. Um, the nerve in it is just right there and it's horrible, but I'd rather, I'd rather have, I'd rather look like Swiss cheese. Oh yeah, there's another one there. Um, I'd rather look like Swiss cheese than not be here for John as he grows up. So bring it on. Slice me up. I don't care. All right, guys. So um, we're at the 7 o'clock point. And I really appreciate everybody that checked in. We're most likely going to, let me see here. Let me pull up a calendar. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, so most likely we will have the next live video on the 5th of next month. I'm not going to do one at the end of this month. I'll do it most likely on the 5th. So feel free to come back, check in. Um, Throw some more comments up here, and if you have something, you know, that I didn't get a chance to comment on tonight or something like that that's really important, feel free to send me an email, send me a message on Facebook through the Facebook page, or show up in two weeks for the next chat. Everybody have fun, stay out of trouble, and thank you for supporting me.